So hello and welcome to my to the next episode of my podcast uh, Gina's Excellent Encounters. Today number seven, and together with me is Jeremiah again. Hello, who you know from from the first podcast, and Zichan. Hello, Zichan. Hello. <laughs> Could you introduce yourself? Um, um, I'm uh, Zichan Ali. Um, I um, originally am from Pakistan, and uh, I lived in Finland for a long time. And I worked at Nokia in in Finland, and uh, then I was working for Red Hat in Finland, and I was in UK and uh, London for a while. And uh, recently, I moved to to Gothenburg, uh, Sweden, to to work for the same company as Gina and, and Jeremiah, which is Pelagicor, uh, to work on IBI systems in the open source world. And um, uh, previously, I have been like a GNOME uh, developer, more like. And now um, at Pelagicor, I'm working on something called the uh, Genevi Development Platform, which uh, short to G- GDP, usually. Um, yeah. So that's my work now. <laughs> okay, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so we will be talking about uh, FOSDEM, which was last weekend, and we all attended again. <laughs> it was my second uh, one, uh, but I think you guys have been there a couple of times. Yeah, I've been. I think I've been going since 2006, and you've been since what? 2007. Uh, 2007, so? and I think I have attended every year since then. Yeah, so. I missed a couple. So, yeah. Yeah. so what did you think this year? So hmm, I had a lot more drinks than last year. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, that's always the danger. I, I stay away from the drinking. I love to go to Delirium, but uh, mm-hmm. it makes for a difficult conference. It's hard to recover. It's especially in the morning when you wake up and, oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you wait a little bit, a little bit, and then suddenly it's 12 o'clock. And exactly. shit, I missed already a couple of ones. Exactly. And then it was... I got the feeling that uh, there were more, even more people than last year. Really? Because it was even more full. So, so normally you, you, you have this app where you, Mm. where where you bookmark what you want to see or whatever. And if you do it like, if you bookmark every, every hour, then you can't see basically anything because you go to somewhere and it's full already. Yeah. So you miss the next one. So you need to like make half an hour in between for, for just standing in line yeah. to get into the talks you, you really want to go. That happened to me like five for five talks or something. That's so. terrible. Ah, damn it. But I have to make an ad for that Fostem app, Fostem companion. It's really good. Yeah, yeah it is really good. Um, yeah. There, there is a, a bit of a problem with the gap in between. Like, there's no gap in between talks. Yeah. yeah. So what happens is that when you're giving your talk at the end of it, when you take questions, like a lot of people get up and start going out, That's and true. it creates so much noise that you can't really interact anymore with the audience. It was a big problem at the embedded dev room yeah. this year, I think. And and I talked with Philippe de Swert, one of the organizers, and he was like, "Yeah, we need to make a, a bit, yeah. bigger space in between." The thing is that if you have say five minutes or ten minutes in between each talk. That after ten talks becomes almost an hour, yeah. and then you you have to cut off a couple talks. But yeah, yeah. yeah. such is life. Cool. Still, hey, it's it's very it's very noisy at the end of the talks. Yeah, and do you know about this because uh, you've been giving a talk last year. Yep. W- was it what was it about? I can't remember. Um, it was a general talk on Geneva and open source software for automotive. Okay. Um, so it wasn't as specific as Zishan's this year on the GDP. Okay, but tell us about the GDP and your talk. Um, so Genevi Development Platform is about, like, uh, Genevi creates two kind of products, which one is the baseline, which is a Yocto layer for uh, to make it easy to create compliant uh, IBI systems. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and Yocto is what? <laughs> Yocto is a build system okay. uh, that um, allows you to um, have recipes for different software and put it all together, like build so, it and put it together. So basically you create a custom distribution. Yeah, you, Linux create, distribution. you create a system, Linux distribution, and that you can boot. Does it have to be Linux or... I don't think so. No, okay. But you really? just need the recipes, I think. I don't yeah. think you can create other systems. Because if you have a different kernel... But I, I think if you yeah. don't... Currently, if you don't have any other like uh, recipes for any other, okay, yeah. that's different. But if you do res- have recipes, then I think it should be possible. Hmm. Um, I don't see why not. 
Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, so so yeah. Anyway, there is a Yocto layer which is just a baseline, and it's it's a it's, it just creates a bootable command line application. Uh, sorry, uh, image, and um, you can uh, you can you can use that to to create your system, but you will have to add quite a lot because it's just basic stuff. Um, and it's for for basically a. For, create, for cars for creating IVI systems yes okay. uh, but more specifically Gen EV compliant uh, and IVI is in vehicle well, infotainment which yeah, we yes. mostly work yeah. with yeah yeah and uh, so uh, since uh, baseline is very basic mm -hmm. um, uh, we, there was a need felt for um, something that gives you a, a bit more and you have more tools on on the on a platform which is now G gdp genevi development platform which is the like, full stack from yeah it's a full stack with a ui with a ui and um, uh, including ui uh, d toolkit uh, but the ui is only for demo and for um, Uh, showing that what you can do with it, it's not meant for actual systems. Uh, and okay, yeah. What what UI is it? Some it's it? it's an HMI uh, written based on Qt. Okay, uh, and then Qt is on 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 board already, so you can use that. Is it Neptune or is it something else? No, it's it's not Neptune. Okay. It's uh, but you can like do some uh, play music or something. Yeah, okay. uh, not not right now. <laughs> but uh, okay. it's it's very demo ish. Okay. Like um, you have buttons for things, and you have the um, one app that you launched for um, controlling the um, air conditioning and and those kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, that kind of it's just a demo. There's no air, actual air conditioner, of course. I see. I see. Okay. So um, yeah, and there's a audio manager application that you can launch, and you can control. Um, Like it, it's it's also a demo, so yeah. you can uh, play like reversing sound, and it shows you like which is more prioritized. So if you play the reverse, the car reversing sound, and at the same time you play a music, so the music will be faded out when, when the car is. There. And that's a real implementation in uh, in GDP. It's so the audio manager, yeah, which is not Pulse Audio but something else, I guess. It's uh, it's based on Pulse Audio. So okay. audio manager API is. Um, Is something that uh, firstly abstracts uh, these uh, audio manager uh, services like Pulse Audio. It, so if you want to replace Pulse Audio with something else, you can because there's audio manager and applications are supposed to use that API. Uh, also, there is some like uh, IVI specific stuff that it adds on top. Okay. Because Pulse Audio doesn't care about IVI, yeah. so um, yeah, you you will need to add something. But it's not like Jack low latency or anything; just normal mixing. Yeah, yeah, uh, by default, yeah. But you can uh, uh, place Jack on it and replace uh, Pulse Audio. I see. Uh, more easily because of this uh, API. And you're the maintainer of GDP. Yes, currently I was. I became maintainer in uh, December in 2016. So not not many months I have been maintainer, and um, and at the same time I started learning GDP because I wasn't involved before in GDP before I became maintainer. Yeah. So um, <laughs> jumping uh, right in. <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't mean that uh, I I didn't have any help. Uh, Jeremiah helped uh, has been very helpful in getting me introduced mm -hmm. and also very supportive of my ideas and stuff. And you have a background in software development. So yeah, you know, uh, and I and I did so. like when I joined uh, Pelagico, I started working with Yocto already, uh, so I had some idea of how it uh, the whole system works. And you've been maintaining other open source software already. Yes, yeah. I have been. Um, I've, uh, previously, I was maintaining something called Boxes. It's a virtualized, uh, virtualized, well, virtual machine manager, okay. uh, mostly. Uh, for GNOME and um, it makes dealing with virtual machines extremely easy and then there is um, I made created and maintained Rigel which is the DLNA media server renderer and before that GUPNP which is the library that Rigel uses for yes, UPNP yes. Um, so yeah I've been maintaining quite a few things <laughs> and also yeah. I have been maintaining uh, GeoClue which is um, uh, uh, 
a geolocation uh, framework. It's a DBus service that mm. finds where you are using different uh, services and different ways. Mm. Uh, so I, I rewrote that, and the rewrite is uh, something I maintain. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, we should have a podcast just on the software you maintain. <laughs> I, now I want to know more about boxes. I should really use it, shouldn't I? Yeah. And you're flying helicopters, so that yeah, also be that's right. It. Yeah. Did I not mention? Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I do. I have a helicopter license, so we we should have a podcast about that at least. <laughs> we will. <laughs> okay. How long have you had this one, the helicopter license? I actually got my license just before I moved to Sweden in in UK. So I have been working on it for two years. Uh, uh, it's extremely expensive, so oh, yeah. I had to. I couldn't do it very fast. Uh, if yeah. you if you have all the money you you, you want uh, you, you need, then you can do it within a month or two. <laughs> uh, well, two months. Yeah. Uh, and but I took two years. So. so so around about how how much money did oh, it cost? Uh, <laughs> it it depends on how fast you do it. So the okay. faster you do it, the less you need, but you need need it more upfront. Okay, okay. So if you want to divide it because of your salary, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get <laughs> all in at once. So um, yeah, uh, then it will take longer okay. and uh, more money. So um, uh, uh, we are talking at least uh, sixteen thousand pounds. Uh, and maximum, well, I'm saying pounds because I did it in yeah, in, yeah. in there in UK, um, and uh, maximum I would say thirty thousand. Okay. So that's quite a lot. But if you if you're really into it, it's <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Then you can fly helicopters and you don't need a car. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, then you need you to buy one 60, too. And, oh yeah, that's true. But are there IVI systems in the helicopters? <laughs> Not really, actually. Uh, helicopters, uh, the one we fly, usually like pre people usually fly, are very primitive. They yeah. they are from 80s, like the, all the tech, tech is from 80s and maximum 90s. Okay. It's um, very rarely you see something that's more recent. There has been a new helicopter called Cabri G2 by Eurocopter, uh, the French company. And uh, that's that's very modern and stuff. Yeah. But they still use a carburetor engine for some reason. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's from So, no electric self-driving uh, no, flying <laughs> no no there is no chance of that because uh, people try to put things on on them like on their own yeah uh, just for experimentation yeah, like yeah. i saw a video of someone putting like the helicopter i fly is r44 they had put a battery on it like a really huge battery under it okay it's and they were flying heavy. on electric power not not any engine really but like yeah. for two minutes like, i guess um, actually more than that okay. so <laughs> it was about 15 minutes i think that they would well lost. that's not bad that's yeah. not very bad for a helicopter yeah. because sometimes you just need to go very yeah. uh, short distances yeah. 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 so um if you can avoid turning the engine and saving the environment uh, why not <laughs> <laughs> but let's go back to to your talk uh -huh. at Fostem. so no let's not <laughs> <laughs> all helicopters all the time exactly uh -huh. but let's do the helicopter next time <laughs> okay good <laughs> uh, so, so did you have a many people listening in yeah there was uh, quite a bit of people like i was not expecting that many people that did it it was pretty big ground it was the biggest yeah. i ever heard, ever had nice I should, I should find out how many that people that room holds but it was it was nearly full yeah and it was one of the bigger rooms yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. the biggest ever room so i would say 80 Is it oh like easily more, much more, more. Oh, okay. much i would say minimum would be 200 yes oh wow yeah <laughs> minimum well i should good that i didn't know because <laughs> yeah. i would have been more nervous <laughs> Yeah. Did, you get, did you get any questions which you didn't know answers uh, for? <laughs> yes uh, the first question I only got two questions because people started moving out yeah so then I couldn't take questions and um, one of the two uh, first question was that um, there was some system someone asked if it's integrated in GDP and I just said I don't I've never heard of it so probably not <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was difficult. And there was a second question was about uh, we have something called Sota client, which is software over the year updating okay. client, yep. and that was written in Rust before, and now it's been ported to C plus plus. Why? Uh, yeah, yeah why? that's that's that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, it's another company doing it. It's not me. Uh, I love Rust. So yeah. for the record, <laughs> I mean. Uh, why not Rust? Uh, that yeah. should be the question. Well, yeah. is it? I, I think we should talk about. Is it Rust hard to learn? 
No. no. It's it's kind of is. But to be fair, but compared to C++, if you don't know C++ and don't know Rust, yeah. there's no difference. Oh yeah, really? Then, then it's not very different. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. If you already know C++, then obviously it's a new language. Yeah. yeah. And depending on how many other languages you know, it's more or less difficult. Yeah. Right. So if but let's say you've fooled around with a lot of languages. Um, then Rust is not that much harder. It's not like Haskell, no, which for exactly. a lot of people finds extremely no, exactly. no, I, I think compared to Haskell, it's much easier. Okay. Especially, um, I think you will grasp all the concepts. And in Haskell, I think nobody understands monads, even people, <laughs> people who claim that they know, I think they don't actually. That, that's kind of <laughs> true, yeah. I wrote uh, one uh, IRC client in Haskell, uh -huh. and I wanted to, it to, if it sees a Twitter URL, it should just download it and post it with the content never got it working <laughs> uh, <fascinating. laughs> you know it, haskell's quite big here in gothenburg isn't it yes because of the, the university, university. Yeah. so we the first thing you you learn uh when you do computer science the really first course is haskell uh, so our, it's actually curse or fun function <laughs> <laughs> <Both> course. <laughs> actually it's they call it functional programming uh -huh. and not haskell ah. we just use haskell to learn functional programming and it's it's with everything else also we we learned uh, uh, object oriented programming and not java uh -huh. Yeah. So okay. On. So we never, we never had a course yeah. which was about some language. Yeah. It was just you had you had to, to learn the language on yourself. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. You could just the concept of like what is uh, imperative programming or right. whatever What's that function? they teach you. So that was a lot of like focus on 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 the concepts, mm -hmm. never of on any languages. But I, I guess it makes sense. I mean, yeah, if you if you want too. to like, firstly, if you want to learn functional programming, so Haskell is like the natural choice. Like if yes. that's your focus is, yeah. and. Uh, Secondly, if you want to tomorrow, there is a better functional programming language. You can just replace the implementation and exactly. not the whole and course still and the concepts. Same Often course. it's just syntax. Yeah, but they, at MIT they teach Scheme, which is a dialect of Lisp, yeah. and they have amazing course materials around Scheme that they built up over the years. And mm. uh, this book called SICP, Structure and Interpretation yeah. of Computer. Yeah, that's programs, very famous. Which is, which is famous. Mm. Yeah, and I think Scheme's a lot easier to learn than mm. Haskell. At least for me, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe it, I'm it, thick. I guess it depends on if you're coming from from the math angle, then mm. um, Haskell is really easy because okay. you just translate your math into Haskell. It's just a little bit difference in the syntax. Uh, if okay. you're coming from imperative uh, programming, right. then obviously Haskell is uh, like this math thing yeah. throws you off. <laughs> So I guess that's... I went to... I used to work for Ericsson a long time ago, uh, well, 2008, and I went to a talk by Simon Peyton Jones on Haskell. And it turns out that he was a researcher for Microsoft. Uh, they just paid him to do research. I didn't understand a word he said. <laughs> I did not understand a single word. And I'm not, you know, computer guru, but I usually can get the jargon and some of the gists of stuff. But my... God, was this hard done? <laughs> mm. I guess it, it was really funny in uh, Finland as well. Like they in the uh, CS course in there, they had like introduction to programming through this book, this uh, structure and interpretation, SIGP, yeah. or whatever it's called, and it was in Scheme. But then all of a sudden they realized, okay, this is not actually people don't use it in yeah. professional <laughs> lives ever. So they remove, they replace it with Java. Oh so now they God. teach programming, which I think Java. is a mistake. Yeah, I, I mean, know. There's but, so many Java programmers yeah. out there who learn from school and go out and get a job, but that's all they know, and yeah. and that's not real world programming. Yeah, I mean, I do think you have to understand the functional stuff, even if you're not going to write a lot in it. That's true. Yeah. It makes you a better programmer. It does. It to be exposed to that paradigm. For exactly. Sure. It makes your thinking so different, and the code's so much shorter if you can mm -hmm. think in in functional programming. Yeah. Yeah. In C, in the imperative languages, you're always fighting with the tools. But I yeah. guess Rust has good tools for that. Um, well, you don't have crashes, for example. Right. Which So you don't have to think about. But the thing is, you will fight more with um, 
like in, when you're coding in C, you fight a lot with the crashes and, and stuff like yeah, that. And then you need to GDP bugger. and stuff. Uh, but in Rust, it's the other way around. Like all your prog- problems are moved a bit up. Okay. So in the beginning, you will have a lot of trouble getting things compiled because the compiler will tell you this is wrong, this is wrong, you should not be doing this. And at first it would be frustrating and slowly it gets like better and better and then you realize how to code. Mm. And then y- you will not have any problems, like not, not uh, either at um, build time or runtime. So. Yeah, I had have this exact problem with Haskell. So once once it compiles, yeah, it's ninety percent right. Okay, <laughs> but until it compiles, it takes some time. Yeah. <laughs> but it is good because then it makes you realize that your mistakes and uh, yeah, you become a good programmer if you understand the the error messages. Yeah, yeah, we have to learn about type systems and things like that. I mean, I think safety is important. I think a lot of times we just sort of programs are hacked together. Yeah, and we don't think about things like security and type I, I safety. I think there should be some similar rule for Git messages because <laughs> I, I totally I, agree. My I, God, I'm I'm update. I'm very, yeah, <laughs> that's the commit message update. I yeah, that's not I'm, even okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very perfectionist in when it comes to like uh, keeping quality and stuff. Mm. So one of the things that you need to do to keep quality is um, having proper Git history. And commit messages are important. And so, but the thing is, which is really unfortunate that I see most programmers don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And they just write whatever they want to write. Many times they won't even write anything meaningful at all. Mm -hmm. And and if when they do, it will be very vague and not even mention all the changes that they made. So... (laughs) But that's what the diff is for. <laughs> <laughs> Has some one of you been listening into the Rust talk at Foster? No, did oh, you? Uh, I went to one of them, okay. and unfortunately, it was the very wrong one. Oh. I was told that there was a good one, which I somehow missed. Okay. And the wrong one that I went to was like it. It was the title was something like "Development of Rust: How Rust is Developed." I think. I see. Okay. And I went there, and I realized after fifteen minutes that. Uh, it was all about showing graphs of GitHub that uh, how much activity is on those bugs and how much acti- so it was all showing statistics which I could find on my own very yeah, easily. Right. I guess so, so I was I was really disappointed with it because I was expecting they'll tell us like oh we had problem with uh, with uh, for example garbage collection and right. how we implemented that yeah. and some actual technical stuff but it wasn't so and I missed the other one. <laughs> and and FOSTEM can be like that. You yeah. can get some talks that are just amazing and other talks that are like me. Yeah. But you can watch all the talks online also. Yes, yeah. you can. Uh, that's important to note that every single talk they they film and many talks have their slides up. I mean they try and force people to put the slides up but you know you can't. But yeah. And uh, and they have a really good system because as a speaker now I I immediately after I got a link to my uh, the video and they yeah. said that you can correct if there is like not right and I just adjusted it and then it was like saved and it was all, all okay and then they uploaded it so before yeah. first time was over okay. That's well, am- they did it almost right away like a dead conf it yeah. takes weeks for them to do yeah. the video but here but but I think that the good thing was that they have now a system that allows speaker to handle it for them yeah but so, what, what do you handle I don't get it uh, so the start and end of it so they are oh, not it's see, not always correct okay because the video keeps going on recording one talk after the yeah, other yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, they do it like uh, they, they look at the schedule and just put the timestamps and cut it like that okay okay um, but they are not sure that if it's correct okay. uh, and that's why it takes very long for most uh, for conferences to like adjust the, the ah, cut, because it's cut. a lot of videos so how many talks were there like 668 yeah that's a lot of video that is a lot of editing yeah so so yeah so by delegating by delegating the task yeah. to do editing that they have accomplished quite quite oh, a lot nice nice i agree and i think getting it out there really quickly is a, a real benefit to the yeah, community exactly but because once you go home like yeah. like yeah. me you forget it's Exactly. Yeah, and, and you blog about it immediately after, right? Exactly. And you, want to, and and you certainly send your link like, right away. Here's see my talk if you yeah, didn't get here. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Perhaps in some a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And after when a couple of out, months, you. You, you share it and they're like, huh? Eh. Oh, yeah. What so was what? that? Old news. <laughs> Moved on from that. <laughs> what's what's first time again? <laughs> yeah. We're on the next, we're at the next conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it's an amazing conference, I think. Uh, what I think is kind of cool is not just the the GDP talk and stuff like that, the, but it's that um, 
a lot of projects use it sort of as a checkpoint. It's the biggest Debian conference outside of DevComp, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think for open source automotive in the industry that we work in, this is one of the biggest conferences. The Geneva AMMs are a lot of open source nowadays, and that's pretty big. But for for you know for open source automotive, this Fostem is really huge. Yeah. And it's it's not uh, just a conference. Like I th- I see less of it as a conference, more as a meeting opportunity yeah. because you meet people you work with every day in open mm-hmm. source and not. Get yeah, people them. who you just know their name from yeah. mailing yeah, exactly. and you get, you get to see their faces. And also people who whose software you've been using like yeah. since exactly. whatever. <laughs> exactly, like Curl, Daniel Steinberg, yeah. who wrote Curl, is always there and stuff like that. I met the new maintainers of uh, Grub. Huh. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, this girl and this guy, I think they're both from Russia. Wow. I didn't know that. No, me neither. That's amazing. <laughs> Should I still use it? <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's the most secure one, I guess. <laughs> but, but Grub is used, isn't it? Or is it Grub? Yeah, it's just, Yeah, it's a GNU project. Yeah. I think it's my machine is Grub, right? It's Grub it's 2, Tandor. probably. Grub 2, yeah, yeah but yeah, still, yeah. it's the yeah. same project, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so, too, yeah. They had a new logo or like a mascot. Uh-huh. So they've been looking at the Linux text and they came up with a crab, which is a balloon <laughs> or something. Okay, why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Debian actually has a chicken, oh. which is really scary looking. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you the mascot. It's okay. really horrible. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's fun to meet a lot of people. I've been looking at this one project called ESAR and it's maintained by this guy, I think. Uh, yeah. He maintains that. I've never met him. He came to uh, Fostem. Anyway, he, he comes up to me. He starts talking to me. He's like, because I'm sitting in the dev room. I'm helping out there. And he says, well, can I test my laptop before the talk starts? Uh, you'll have a tiny bit of a chance in between talks. I don't know. I was like, mm-hmm. he's like you know, it's cool. What's your name? And he said his name. I said, oh, my name's Jeremiah. I was like, oh, oh, I know you. I didn't recognize you without your mustache. But I don't have a mustache, oh. which was really weird. But I do on my GitHub account because I was walking uh, with my, oh, <laughs> my yeah. daughter in the woods. And we found this bark that had fallen from a tree. And I made a pretend mustache. She thought that was hilarious. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the icon is so small that I guess it kind of looks like a real mustache. So yeah, yeah. I, guess. I have to change that. <laughs> people think I have a big fuzzy mustache. I don't. I have no mustache. Oh. <laughs> that's the problem of misrepresenting yourself online. Exactly. <laughs> People think that's really you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, yeah. But that only happens if you use your real name. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody will. You can invent your persona like Gina. Exactly. No one would ever know. That <laughs> you're Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry. You can edit that out. <laughs> It's too late. <laughs> when, when you when you do a who is on my on my domain, then you see my real name already. So. Really, you can hide that. I know, but I didn't know that back, back then, then, and okay. then now it's too late. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> so, what else about Fostem? What else can we say? I, what? I participate also in this uh, key signing event this time. Oh, oh yeah, I have always right. been yeah. wanting to, but this time I actually did, and it was it was actually pretty interesting okay. it is because what happens is that you you get a paper mm-hmm. like you first submit your keys right and um submit to where uh, they have a system so yeah. online they create a, a like first a, put time a system or what? yeah yeah first time system yeah. and we're talking about gpg keys gpg keys sorry okay and um so you submit that they collect it there's a deadline for it and then after that deadline they just have a list of okay. all the keys public signatures and they um publish that and you have you're supposed to print it out and uh, then identify where you are because there is numbered like indexed okay so you say for example on minus minus 16 this time so i note it down which is is and everyone does the same and also i check my key uh, fingerprint if it's correct okay and uh, i tick mark that it is correct and then at the event what that happens is that it's sometimes outside if the weather is fine, yeah. but this time it was inside. So they create two lines and they are like uh, in front of each other, yeah. people. And you get turned, like it keeps revolving. So you get a turn with one person at a time and um, uh, you show, you tell him where your key is on the list because you both have the same list. And um, How do you know that I have the same list as you have? Because you printed it on the, from the same place. Yeah. And it doesn't matter as long as you can both find the keys and they're both yeah. printed. Okay. Then you 
they tell you their key, yeah. and then they give you the kind of documents that would assure you that that's really them. Yeah. And like, since the key is printed. Like ID card. Yeah, or, uh, government issued ID with signature yeah. and photo and that yeah, kind of thing. I, I had a funny moment, actually. Um, I bumped into a guy who um, I showed him my uh, Swedish uh, ID card. And he looked at it and he said, uh, well, it doesn't say where it's from. I'm like, well, it says in Swedish. And he said, I don't know that. <laughs> and He's I was right, like, I okay. Um, so I, I, I was recently, I got my driver's license. So I showed him that. And uh, he said, yeah, that's fine. And the funny thing was that it doesn't say Sweden in English. It says Sverige. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if he couldn't read Swedish, how did he know that Sverige means Sweden? <laughs> yeah, <wouldn't> <laughs> so, but it was fine with him. So I was like, sure, why not? Um, There's not an ISO symbol on there somewhere? I don't think so. Uh, don't think but but anyway, so um, you you show your ID uh, to each other and to tell which on the list where where your key is, and you tell them that you have checked your fingerprint. Okay. And each then you keep doing it with multiple people. So the interesting thing is that you meet many different people, like only for a short amount of time, but it's very interesting. Oh, because otherwise you would need to meet all the people personally. Yeah, and yeah. Like there's, there's, it gives you an excuse to meet a lot of yeah. people as well. And it, it's time. not important who you meet, just no. someone else. Yeah. The, the idea, conscious. though, is to build up what's called a web of trust, yeah. where keys trust each other. Yeah. And then that allows you, if, if you trust somebody because they give you a one to five scale yeah. and five being the ultimate trust, one is not trust. Okay. So if you say trust somebody uh, four because you've checked their documentation and you know them well, or maybe five, and they trust somebody three that you've never met, well, that somebody number three can can send a message to you and you can say, hmm, I'm willing to take a chance with this person okay. and then sign their key. And then you can build up this web of trust. And inside that web of trust, we can all communicate with each other. And Debian, in fact, is the largest such web of trust on Earth okay. because they they use uh, GPG keys for everything to sign releases, to sign yeah. packages, and things like so that. So, what UI would you use? Is it like a, for emails? Or? The, what I would what I recommend is GPG directly on the command line, and then there's a tool called CAF. I think it's called CA Certificate Assurance Fire and Forget or something like that inside mm -hmm. Debian um, that allows you to manage your keys fairly well. But I don't know. Maybe there's something in GNOME. Um, that, uh, one of our nice GNOME way. guys was trying to write a UI for it, but I don't know how far the project went. Okay. And um, But you, usually you do it from command line, the management of keys. And um, But like Evolution allows you to like use it for encrypting. And and yeah. also there's like the tools that you use. Like for example, Git, when you do a Git tag on yeah. a release, oh, yeah. you can sign it with your yeah. GPG key. But how can I see what level this message it, it's is? List, like you can use the GPG command to find yeah, out. Yeah, th that you can only do. Yeah, but there are actually graphs too out there on the web that show who signed what and who has so many signatures because okay. you do send that information back with your keys. Okay. So you have to be fairly active and update your key store database. You have to sign other people's keys. You have to get your keys signed, which yeah. is why FOSTEM is so useful. So to build out the web of trust and get involved, but you have to do a lot of gardening. And because it's actually quite difficult to use GPG, um, even for experts, a lot of people are moving away from it. It's just too difficult. And the yeah. If you make a mistake, it can be catastrophic. For example, if you don't have a revocation certificate and and you're you just lose your secret key because your old machine died, yeah. you're really in big trouble. So, I don't know. You know, I mean, that that could be a whole podcast too on how to best use cryptography for ensuring end-to-end -end communication. And I don't. A lot of people are kind of sour on GPG, yeah. but I still think the web of trust in our community and and, and the I, I don't think there could be anything better. Like, what what else could you have? Like, I mean, you, something easier. Yeah, and you have I to mean, do a lot I'm, of work. I mean, the, it's just missing tools. So you add tools. And okay. Then, I mean, sure. the concept, the same concept, same base can be used. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you use Signal or something like that, that that's also end-to-end -end encryption, and you can check the keys. So you can't. That is you have to use Signal. Yeah, yeah. You can't use another non-Signal client, for example, or get yeah. a desktop client. That's true. only on mobile phones right now. Yeah. And there are some tools. For example, Gmail has this tool where you can create a GPG key inside the 
browser somehow. Oh. And that communicates. Yeah, that sounds interesting. There's an implementation of it in JavaScript. Yeah. So someone just cross compiled, I guess, the C implementation, and you can use it now in JavaScript. Yeah, and that's actually quite easy to use. But again, you know, if you can get to somebody's browser, you get the keys. But yeah. still, yeah. I mean, I don't think that's such a big deal. Yeah, but it's but, tricky. Uh, I mean, it doesn't add anything. I mean, if if you need the password to get into the account then you get get access to the key as well right so is the, is that adding anything on the security i mean it's like not really I, yeah. I agree so and then not only can you decrypt a, s- a specific message but you can decrypt everything that was signed with that key yeah. so it's a it's a real catastrophe mm. There's also a, a lot of stuff around FOSDEM. So like the, the, the day before, the, the day after, and on, in, the, in the evenings, yeah. I mm-hmm. heard a lot of like maintainers inviting people to some hotel bar yeah. to, 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 to talk and so on. I guess you've been at Delirium on yeah. Friday, I think? Yeah, I made sure I go there. <laughs> uh, no, I, I each year I make, make sure that I go to Delirium because it's one of the key events in, in there. And um, there you so get to meet a lot of people. what's happening there? Uh, um, well, it's just a bar where everyone meets and have drinks and they give you these tokens to for discounted price on, on beers as well. <laughs> But uh, and uh, at some point in uh, I think around seven eight they they start to keep put people on the doors so that at least people from that are not at first time should not enter. Uh, I see. But uh, this time I realized that if you are uh, a woman, uh, you are. You still get through. <laughs> and they That's were asked sexist. something yeah, about yeah. Uh, force them, and they were like, "What?" And uh, and the guy was like, "You can't go in. It's a private event." And he, they were like, "Come on!" And he was like, "Wow, oh, okay." And so and when he asked me the question, I was like, "Come on! Like, <laughs> if you're not, if you're going to let me through anyway, what's the point?" So, um, yeah, but you're not, fe- not female. So. Yeah, but that's that's a thing in all clubs. So. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, this is not supposed to be club. It's, it's like, yeah. yes, anyway. But so that that's there. So at least they have some kind of flow control, and but still, there's a lot of people. It's and jam-packed. at some point, it gets so jam packed that you don't want to be there anymore. At least inside. So many people stand outside and like meet people and stuff, mm. and also go to the other bar. There's a bar in front of it. And you can get drinks from there as well, which are not discounted, but at least yeah. you can get a drink. I see. And you can get absinthe there also. Yeah, yeah I, I, <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> yeah. So um, we had absinthe lo- the year before. That was fun. Yeah, I had this year, mm-hmm. but a really bad one. Oh, dear. Like uh, 87.9%. And then it, it was fruits or something. It tastes oh, yeah. really, really not, not really good. Uh, so I, I already hate licorice. So, uh, and this tastes like licorice with fruits or something. <laughs> Uh, Belgian beers and Belgian stuff is that is true. Belgian beers is uh, awesome. I got a meeting, guys. So okay, okay. Yeah. But I guess we we talked about almost everything. Yeah. So oh, good. There is also meetings in in Fosnam, Just briefly mentioning mm-hmm. um, when I was uh, there. So uh, we had, um, for example, Jenny V people and all the people who work with automotive stuff. Yeah. They had a big dinner and uh, we went there and I met like people of the uh, other camp, which is the AGM, <laughs> Automotive Grid Linux. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I met them and uh, also met the previous Jenny V maintainer and stuff. So we had a long discussions. And also uh, my uh, the project manager I work with in Jenny V, in GDB, uh, I met him for the first time okay. uh, because of the conference, and he arranged a few other meetings with uh, with developers of different components, and to make sure that everything is uh, you know in in time. Yeah. So there is a lot of work meetings that were take place as well because everyone is there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Even uh, though it was not, it was you were on your private time there. So yeah. Still. Kind of. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a private time. 
get compensated a bit, I guess. Yeah, but no, I'm I'm counting as work time, and okay. I, I think it shouldn't should be because I was mostly attending meetings and yeah, I was yeah. I was giving a talk and and yeah. it was everything. So I'm I'm hoping that it's work time because <laughs> okay. yeah yeah okay. And I, I didn't work That's on true. Monday either. <laughs> so. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, Jeremiah already left, so exactly, I yes. think we should <laughs> <laughs> we should wrap it up. Yeah. But it was awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm going next year again. Cool. I guess you guys too. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So uh, check out uh, Sishan's uh, talk. I will link to it in the show notes. Cool. Thanks. And uh, don't ex- don't expect anything spectacular. It's just no, but it's just my first talk of GDP. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just a overview of what it is and so on. So perhaps sometimes someone gets interested and will. Um, well, it was a talk about uh, as I described what GDP is. So it just was just an overview yeah. of that. Yeah. And it was only thirty minutes, so I was a bit nervous because there was very little time to get all the all the stuff out in there. Sure. And um, almost every thing I talked about in the in 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 the talk was something that needed explanation to at least someone <laughs> yeah. so i had to explain a lot and um but still i somehow managed to get it finished in time mm-hmm. which is sometimes it well usually doesn't happen yeah yeah and i have to in the end like uh, go very fast because yeah. uh, they tell me oh five minutes left <laughs> and, I <was> like, oh, <laughs> shoot. and i have 30 slides <laughs> yeah. yeah so so yeah this time it didn't happen so i was happy about that at least nice and most of the things i I was good at like, but there was times when I was so nervous that I couldn't form a coherent sentence. (laughs) (laughs) And then you forgot to introduce yourself in the beginning also. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But it went, I think it went. It was okay. I watched the talk later. (laughs) Yeah. I watched the talk later uh, at home. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk soon again. Yeah, hopefully. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.